Our next speaker is Thomas Sudhoff, a professor at Stanford University School of Medicine and winner of the 2013 Nobel Prize for his work on vesicle trafficking. Today, he is joining us virtually to discuss, excuse me, to discuss a crucial issue for the entire scientific community, integrity. As technological advances has, have enabled an accelerating amazing, excuse me, enabled and accelerated amazing research, they can also create serious challenges when it comes to ethical research practices. Motivated by his personal experience, Dr. Sudhoff will tell us about these challenges and how the scientific community can support responsible research contact, conduct. Dr. Sudhoff, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope I, I everybody can hear me. I will be talking about something that I have not previously talked about, but owing to particular personal experiences, I felt that it was necessary for me personally, and I hope helpful for others, to discuss some of the issues I'm raising. So the big question here is, what does scientific truth mean, and how is it related to science integrity? And in philosophy, one debates truth in absolute terms. Does absolute truth actually exist? Can we as humans ever know whether a particular statement reflects truth, i.e. whether it is truthful? And that question alone reveals the two facets of any discussion about truth, which is whether a particular conclusion in itself is correct and whether the statement of that conclusion is correct. In other words, Truth and language are inseparable, except possibly in mathematics, explaining why mathematical truth is more straightforward than other types of truth. I've always been fascinated by truth, but I'm not a philosopher and discussing truth in philosophical terms is beyond my expertise. Instead, I would like to talk about truth as a scientist, as a practicing scientist, namely about science integrity and the absence of scientific truth, which is falsity. And to start, let me propose a working description of scientific truth, which is that scientific truth is the same as interpersonal truth, as facts that we agree on in a personal communication. If two or more people communicate something they observe and agree on what they observe, they consider it truth. And obviously, this is not always the case because people can share illusions, as famously uh, is exemplified by the Lysenko um, affair in the Soviet Union. But pragmatically, even a common illusion sooner or later disappears in the communication between people. In science, we traditionally frame scientific truth in terms of whether or not a hypothesis is correct i.e. can be falsified, which works great for physics, but is less useful in biomedical research because biomedical research in its very uh, nature is more exploratory. Here, a hypothesis is always limited by the nature of the underlying observations, which in turn are dependent on the ever-changing technical approaches that are used to define those observations. So here, the hypothesis falsification is not as straightforward. Nevertheless, science integrity is meant to ensure scientific truth. And as I already mentioned, although I've been broadly interested in the nature of scientific truth ever since I became a scientist, recent revelations about my own lab have made the subject very personal. And some of you have may seen this science article which investigated the work in my lab, it was appeared a couple of months ago. I thought it was actually a very fair article, although I also thought that the headline was somewhat misleading. What this article says is that um, since the mid-2022 uh, social media website, non-scientific, called Papier, has flagged more than 30 papers, especially flagged by Dr. Elizabeth Bick. And this flagging, this questioning, has led to a great degree of questioning in our own lab. 
And so I wanted to briefly discuss with you what is the nature of these accusations and how are we dealing with it? And so the people, the major people who are making these accusations are shown here, Dr. Elizabeth Bick, Dr. Leonid Schneider, Dr. Martin von Kampen and others who run professional websites investigating possible mistakes in people's works. And there, as well as their assistants and their collaborators, ac accusations have flagged, as I already mentioned, many papers alleging more than 50 mistakes in our papers over 25 years. At present, we actually did confirm 18 mistakes using raw data implicating 20 or more further lab former lab members. And these are some of the pictures of the people who have basically uh, admitted or uh, found these mistakes upon being um, alerted to them. So what is the nature of these allegations and these mistakes? And when are these allegations actually impactful or unfounded? Or when, they are, when are they trivial? Let me first start with those allegations that we consider rather unfounded. This is a typical example taken uh, from a very recent post by Dr. Elizabeth Bick. And the allegation here is that this blood was manipulated because there are micro areas that are outlined here in these boxes in this blood, which are duplications, micro duplications within the blood. And you can see that these are rather, rather unusual micro duplications. You can see that there's areas that are sort of transplanted randomly between different areas of these blots. And so the idea is that someone, presumably the postdoc who actually did these blots, somehow transplanted these micro cloned or cloned these areas and duplicated them. However, it turns out that such artifacts commonly observed, are commonly observed, commonly occur in scanned resolution images with older software, which spontaneously and randomly duplicates micro areas of background. If the software determines that these micro areas are similar, then it doesn't actually record them, but it simply duplicates them because nobody would see this before the advent of artificial intelligence fueled a software that detects these uh, duplications within blots, fraudulently inducing, introducing such duplications of micro areas makes no sense. It wouldn't. It doesn't improve the blot. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything of the data because these are sort of spanning um, lanes. So you're not actually changing lanes. You're just basically changing the background, which is presumably done by the various softwares, applications that are used to first scan and then reproduce and reproduce the reproduction of the blood. So this is a typical example of what we find rather unfounded. Another example is shown here where Dr. Elizabeth Bick wants me to clarify my contribution to this paper that is shown here, which was actually published relatively recently. And so this paper is flagged because Dr. Pick alleged that I may be an honorary author, which is inappropriate. But when you look at the affiliations of the authors, it is clear that the senior author, Anton Maximov, did most of the work actually in my lab when he was a postdoc. And then he took the project with him to his own lab, like often happens with my former postdocs, who then continue the work and we stop working on it. And in this case, there is basically a collaboration then between the two labs. His prior postdoc work and his current work goes into this paper. There is no honorary uh, authorship. So lots of paper were questions like this with these types of accusations, often micro duplications or duplications of blots that are identified by artificial intelligence uh, procedures. However, there were also multiple cases where we did make mistakes. And these mistakes are clear mistakes, which we are trying to correct. Let's look at some of these mistakes to sort of give you an impression of what these mistakes really are. So for example, in a very recent paper, we made this mistake. We actually pasted 
one of these images instead of the other image. And can you see the difference in these images? They look very similar, but well, it turns out that the left was the wrong image, which was accidentally tasted, pasted from a previous figure compared to the right image. And this was in a large number of panels within a supplementary figure of this paper. And this paper alone contains 373 images and more than 130 graphs. So the postdoc who pasted this image, the first author, J.R. Wang, um, was actually made a mistake. And she was devastated because she didn't press the copy button. So she felt really um, very unhappy about this. And she is now posting the entire raw data for this paper so that everything can be checked. But it was a mistake. There's no doubt it was a mistake in that there was a mistakenly posted um, image. There's another example where we make the mistake in a recent paper shown here, where the original wrong one is shown on the left and the corrected one is shown on the right. And again, it's a control image. It's very difficult to detect because the control, one of the control aggregation panels was accidentally copy pasted twice. So most of the true errors in our paper were errors that shouldn't have happened. Once they happened, we didn't identify them because you needed artificial intelligence to basically identify them. You couldn't really see them with the naked eyes if you're not pointed to them. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, that's not an excuse. They shouldn't have happened. And these 20 plus postdocs who made these mistakes, isolated mistakes in various papers, they clearly made a mistake, as did I, because I didn't see it. How did these mistakes happen? And why are they now leading to a wave of accusations? What are the implications for science integrity? What you see here is a plot of the entire time of my lab, starting before I actually started my own lab in 1986, a long time ago. And you see the number of papers published as a three-year moving average. And you can see that over the last 25 years or so, this number of paper has been very constant with a slight decline over the years. So you can see that it goes from 20 papers in 1995 to about um, 18 or 16 papers now on average per year. And you can also see that there's a start of digital image pasting, and that coincides with the beginning of pasting errors. So whenever we started to actually paste images into figures, we made mistakes. We started making mistakes. And these mistakes are now becoming apparent because now there are new AI tools that can actually scan all these papers and find these mistakes that we have missed previously. But we are grateful to the community for alerting us to these mistakes because they were mistakes and they should be corrected even though they are almost always in control panels and supplementary figures where the actual mistaken um, image and the real image uh, are almost indistinguishable. And all of these allegations and errors are discussed transparently in detail on our website that you might want to consult in order to understand the extent of these mistakes and how we deal with them, but also the extent of how uh, we are being uh, corrected here by the community in making these mistakes. Prompted by these revelations, I would like to now raise broader questions, which is how much does publication of incorrect illustrative images impair science integrity and violate truth? And how do such mistakes fit into the general landscape of science integrity impairments? There's another question that might be asked, how much do unfounded accusations impair scientific practices and endanger the careers, especially of young scientists? But that is beyond today's discussion, although I can tell you that the impact has been quite severe, unfortunately. So to discuss these questions, I propose to classify scientific errors. And this classification is shown here in this picture, which shows that on the left side, there are the unintentional errors. 
which are usually copy-paste mistake, mislabeled graphs, figure legend errors, things like that. Then the intention and manipulations, which are fraud, where images are purposely altered, where the numbers are invented or manipulated samples. This is the cl classical misconduct, the classical basic fraud in science that does exist and is, is a, a severe problem. These two very different types of errors are what people normally mean when they're discussing scientific errors because they are now relatively easily detectable with new artificial intelligence tools that were not previously available. However, I would like to represent that there's two additional types of scientific integrity issues which are possibly just as important, namely misrepresentations of data and misinterpretations of data. These rarely discussed issues are more difficult to identify and to argue about because they are not based on data that are wrong, they are based on the interpretation or the presentation of data, but I think that they are just as serious threats to scientific truth as are the left two. Let me come back to the left two errors here. What differentiates these unintentional, honest mistakes from intentional manipulations? And it's very important here that unintentional errors are usually isolated cases by multiple scientists often very different scientists over many years. Most importantly, they don't usually improve the data. They are, these mistakes have no effect on making a study more or less convincing. They don't change the data. They affect details in multi-component data. They usually have no impact on conclusions. They're usually in control panels. And they're very straightforward to detect on police because they're usually some kind of duplications. And that's very different from intentional manipulations, where there's usually a single scientist who commits multiple mistakes. It's usually a beautification of data. It makes the whole story sound better, look better. It manipulates key data and figures. It constitutes a major factor of the conclusions. And it is unfortunately in future will be relatively easy to hide with new AI tools, although in the past, those tools were not available and so it wasn't as possible to actually hide them. The key differentiator here is the intent to improve scientific data, the intent to actually change something in order to make it either look better or the absence of intent where there is a error, a mistake, a carelessness in some cases even that is then afterwards difficult to detect. On the other hand, on the right side, how do misinterpretations and misrepresentations differ from unintentional errors and data manipulation? What's the difference here? The difference is that here we are not dealing with wrong data or manipulated data or erroneous data, but with problems on on how these data are used and presented. Again, these two different categories, misrepresentations and misinterpretations, differ from each other in intent. I posit that misrepresentations are unintentional misrepresentations, whereas misinterpretations are used to basically make look data, make data look better, make them to be more impactful purposefully data interpretations that are not actually in the data. And let me discuss this a little bit more. A typical misrepresentation in my field was the naming of key genes. For example, tenuans were named as tenacin-like major. Even though they are not at all like tenacin, it was a simple misrepresentation and error. The gene symbols in Mammalian organisms are odds one to four because they were described as pair rule genes, which they aren't. Again, an error, an honest error, a misrepresentation that wasn't intentional. Similar, synaptoporin is not, it's a synaptic vesicle protein that doesn't form pores. Brain angiogenesis inhibitors 
uh, adhesion GPCRs that are not brain and geogenesis inhibitors, and so on and on. Another type of misrepresentation is often statistical. It's more impactful because it's important for the conclusion of a study, but many statistical analyses may not actually allow the conclusions because it's a misinterpretation of the data. An example of another unintentional misinterpretation from my own field again here is in this paper, which describes the droplet-based transcriptome profiling of synaptic of individual synapses. But what is actually happening in this paper is that the total homogenate, post-nuclear homogenate from brain that contains vesiculated membranes from all areas, all cell types, was then subjected to individual particle RNA-seq. It measures cytoplasmic mRN levels. It doesn't really measure individual synapses because these are all kinds of vesicles that are formed of spontaneously upon homogenization of a brain and it doesn't represent individual synapses. And it's not surprising, given that synaptic transcripts are in a very abundant, that in these vesicles, there's lots of synaptic genes. It would be wonderful to actually profile individual synapses, but that will require a specific sorting of synaptic, postsynaptic uh, vesiculated structures, which is not available here. Different from misrepresentations, misinterpretations are the intentionally misleading or even wrong description of real data and their significance. So here I'm positing that the misinterpretation involves a knowledgeable and intentional description of the data that doesn't really correspond to the data. So how can we prevent in future these four types of errors? And what are the consequences of these errors? I think there's some straightforward uh, needs here. One is that I do think we need to protect especially junior scientists from sensationalist allegations that have little substance, but basically cause a lot of insecurity, a lot of less of self-confidence, and sometimes a decision to leave science. We also need to run all of us, our figures through AI software to make sure we didn't unintentionally duplicate any kind of images. And obviously all raw data need to be publicly available in cloud depositories, something that wasn't possible until last year, but now these depositories are available and now this is possible. This changes everything in terms of how we do science. And in our lab, we are now depositing all raw data, no matter what, in cloud depositories where there are unrestricted access to anybody who wants to look at them. Not so straightforward, I think, is that we need a different publishing culture and peer review system. Some of the journals have tried to institute these, and I've been impressed, for example, by the measures that Nature has been doing to try to get this done. I think we need this generally. We need generally a requirement for totally transparent peer review with totally transparent data. Um, and we need to communicate better with the public to make sure that the public understands what are two errors in science and what are mistakes that happen, they shouldn't happen, but you know they do happen. And they certainly did happen in my own lab which I find deeply embarrassing um, and can only try to correct at this point, but in some way also maybe at least sometimes quite understandable. Some suggestions for improving science publishing would be to prepay submissions instead of public paying publications afterwards, which removes the incentive of actually by the journal to publish a paper no matter what. It really puts the honors onto the authors to only submit papers that are worth publishing. Mandatory post-publication reviews, really important, I think. Mandatory requirement for follow-up studies, really important. Most important, building a body of evidence that repeatedly tests the specific functional hypothesis from multiple angles, not just repeating experiments, which is often senseless, but from probing conclusions using different types of experiments. Finally, to finish, 
let me come back to the question of truth. The question is whether a particular observation is correct and whether this is, and but this question is only the most basic layer of scientific truth. More important even are the interpretations built on this basic layer. And so we need to make sure that these interpretations, these representations will also be correct and continue to be correct. And at least in biology, no conclusion is ever final, but they build on top of each other. And so we need to try to make sure that this buildup is actually corresponding to the continuing evolution of the data. And to place this into the framework of the integrity classification that I've suggested in this particular slide, this is part of the basic observations and they obviously need to be correct and they need to be corrected if there's mistakes. And this is part of the conclusion hypothesis that are continuously being remodeled, revised, but should always represent truthfully uh, interpretation of the actual basic uh, observations. I'd be happy to discuss these thoughts and I hope that at least some of these ideas might be useful for your thinking. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Sutov, for that really thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we have lots of questions, but unfortunately are not going to be able to have time for all of them. But uh, one that you began to address, but I'm hoping you can give us a little bit more detail about, uh, comes from Dr. Suzanne Kulendahl, who asks, what role should the peer review process play in preserving truthful science and preventing errors? I think the peer review process should primarily operate at the level of misrepresentations and misinterpretations. This is really where the peer review is useful. I think the unintentional errors, for example, that we now found in our own work would not have been detected by peer review simply because they were undetectable without new AI software. And if that new AI software is universally applied in future, which it will be, I'm sure, those kinds of errors will never happen in future. Um, I don't think the peer review process can identify intentional manipulations. I think in future, intentional manipulations will become apparent in the process in by which conclusions, important conclusions, are being reevaluated constantly. For example, one of the uh, major questions in science has been the role of a beta in Alzheimer's disease. And that is a really important question with many imp really impactful studies. And now it turns out that although most of the studies are totally correct and are contributions that will remain for the future and people will build on, some of them may not have been correct. And that came out because they were in other studies not totally reproducible. So I think that this the peer review is absolutely essential and has to be completely transparent. And it is essential because the misrepresentation and misinterpretations, which are often unintentional, you know, this is what peer review is for. It tells authors when they are wrong. And this is what we benefit from peer review. And so this is why peer review is critical for the future of science integrity. Great. Well, thank you so much again for your talk. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Sutoff.